Okay, for this unit, you will um, be learning about how to analyze informational text. Okay, so um, you will not be writing a, an essay for this particular unit, but you will be writing an argumentative essay in unit eight. So for this unit, we're going to be looking at some model te texts. Um, to help you analyze them so that you can prepare to write your own essay. Okay, so in Unit 8, um, you will be writing an essay, but for this Unit 7, you will not be having a portfolio. Instead, you will have a unit test, okay? All right, so in this unit, you're going to learn how to break down a paragraph to see how sentences fit together. You're going to learn how to identify the author's purpose, how to um, see how claims, reasons, and evidence are developed into an argument, and then learn how to evaluate those claims, reasons, and evidence in order to make sure that they support the argument. So remember, this is what you're going to be required to do in Unit 8, is to actually write an argumentative essay. So you're going to need to be able to have all of these components in there. So this unit, we're going to look at examples and break them down and evaluate them so that you can recognize that in your own writing. All right, let's watch a couple of videos on um, how text fits together and how an argument is developed. Hello readers. Today we're going to be talking about how smaller sections of text work together to support the whole text. But first, let us consider Voltron. It is a giant robot made up of five smaller robots, each one piloted by a person. Five friends, each with control over a different part of the robot's body. You're up in the head, I'm operating the right leg, our buddy's operating the left, and so on. In order to walk, or pick up objects, or fight space monsters the size of battleships, all the disparate parts of the robot have to function together. Well, texts work much the same way. Each portion of the text, from the section level down to more granular divisions like individual paragraphs or sentences, is trying to serve the broader point of the text. When we look at Voltron's foot in motion, we analyze what the foot is doing in the service of Voltron as a whole. If Voltron's foot kicks a ball, we have to zoom out to ask, is Voltron playing soccer? This is a pretty abstract idea without any text examples, so let's stop talking about space robots and start talking about the armor of 10th century Japanese horse archers. All right, so this whole passage is about the armor worn by mounted archer samurai of 10th century Japan, Oyoroi, and how it's constructed. So this is a piece of Oyoroi armor. This is the whole assemblage. And that's how the, the piece is divided. Right, We've got these sections here for each component, uh, the cuirass, the osode, or shoulder guards, the kusasuri, or armored skirt, and the kabuto, the helmet. And each one of these elements of the armor connects back to the whole point of the piece, which is describing how the armor does two things. One, it protects the wearer, and two, allows them to ride horses and fire arrows. Now we see this in the introductory paragraph. Their armor, called Oyoroi, was designed specifically to withstand the demands of mounted archer warfare. So let's dig into this first section about the cuirass, the, the, the breastplate and backplate armor. I'll read the first paragraph. A cuirass is usually a piece of armor that consists of a breastplate and a backplate that are attached together. The cuirass for the Oyoroi was a bit different than a typical cuirass, as it was designed to be more effective for an archer. The Oyoroi cuirass had three sections instead of two. A section to protect the back, a section to protect the chest, and a section to protect the left side body. The right side was left open, so the warrior could best utilize his bow and arrow. So this paragraph is describing what a cuirass is and how it functions as armor, but then it goes into detailing how an Oyoroi cuirass is different because it's for someone holding a bow, right? It has three sections instead of two, the right side was left open, so the warrior could best utilize his bow and arrow. This information down to the sentence level all serves the same purpose. It serves to answer the question, how was Oyoroi armor specifically designed to meet the needs of a mounted archer? Not every sentence or every paragraph will address every part of that main question. Note that the curious section doesn't cover anything about how the archers are on horseback. To answer that question, we need to go down to the third section, the kusazuri, the battle skirt. 
I'm not going to read the whole paragraph. Let's just zoom in on this one sentence. The kusazuri were designed so that when the warrior was sitting in his horse's saddle, they fit nicely over the saddle in a skirt-like fashion to protect his lower body and upper legs. This particular sentence tells us how this part of the armor protects a samurai's legs while they're on horseback. The paragraph and section it's part of detail the whole construction of that part of the armor and how it relates to the other pieces. And all of those paragraphs together form one text that explains the thing it set out to explain. What is oyoroi and how does it work for 10th century horse archer samurai? Each section or paragraph is like a leg or an arm of Voltron. Each sentence is a muscle or a finger or a robotoe. Together, moving as one, they tell a story or make an argument, which is, I guess, like Voltron winning a fight? Maybe? I feel like I've carried this metaphor as far as it'll go. The point is, if you're having trouble making sense of an informational text, think of it as a giant battle robot. What is each component part of the text trying to accomplish? And when you put all those parts together, what are they trying to do? Well, my work here is done. You can learn anything. David out. Let's go ahead and watch a second video on um, analyzing an argument. Hi there. When we talk, write, or tell a story, we want to communicate something. Sometimes the information is pretty straightforward, as in 1 plus 1 equals 2, but a lot of times what we share is not so straightforward, so we may need to argue the point. But when someone presents an argument, you don't simply accept it, or do you? Shouldn't you analyze it to see if it's a sound argument? Stick around and let's talk about analyzing the argument. Hi, welcome to Snap Language. I'm Mark Franco. An argument, or a logical argument, is a set of ideas put together to support a point. For example, this is a very simple argument. You like Japanese food, so you'll love the sushi restaurant. The claim is that because you like this, you'll also like that. But is it a good argument? If you understand really well what an argument is, you can then build strong arguments that support your ideas when you speak or write. And of course, when you listen to or read someone's arguments, you can also make sure that the arguments are well built or convincing. To build an argument, you need statements or claims. One of these claims is a conclusion. The other claims are premises. They provide evidence to support your conclusion. Let's look at a very simple example. Hawaii has hot weather year-round and beautiful beaches, so it is the best place for a vacation. There are three claims in this argument. The main point, or the conclusion, is that Hawaii is the best place for a vacation. Two premises support this claim. One, Hawaii has hot weather year-round, and two, Hawaii has beautiful beaches. Let's see how well this argument works. What supports the point that Hawaii is the best place for a vacation? One of the premises used as evidence is that it's hot there year round. Well, if you like hot weather, yes, but what if you don't? And what if you'd rather go skiing? Hmm. The other premise is that Hawaii has beautiful beaches. How do you define beautiful? Why beaches in Hawaii? Aren't there other places in the world with beautiful beaches? What if you prefer the mountains or the city? We're not trying to prove or disprove that Hawaii is a great place for a vacation. We're simply analyzing the argument in this example. Even if you agree that Hawaii is a great vacation spot, you may decide that this argument doesn't make a good case for Hawaii. Let's look at another example. See if you can identify the claims and which is presented as the conclusion and which are the premises that support that conclusion. Cell phones pose serious risks to their users. Several studies have shown a correlation between cell phone use and the development of brain tumors, Hardell. The International Agency for Research on Cancer, IARC, classifies cell phones as a possible cause of cancer. Pause the video now if you need time to identify the claims. Premise 1 is here. Premise 2 is here. The main point, or the conclusion, 
is here. But wait, before you swear never to use a cell phone again, let's analyze the argument. Look at the premises again and ask questions. Are there problems with these premises? Is there sufficient evidence to support the conclusion? Researchers have found a correlation between cell phone use and the development of brain tumors. How good were these studies? A correlation does not mean that cell phones were the cause. Are there studies maybe that found no correlation? The second premise is that they classified cell phones as a possible cause of cancer. A possible cause of cancer means the evidence is not definitive. Do they make that classification based on the same studies mentioned in premise one? If so, this premise is a bit redundant. Again, right or wrong, we're just analyzing the argument. As a critical thinker, you must challenge your assumptions and other people's assumptions. Just because something is in writing doesn't mean it's a fact or the truth. Even if a conclusion is based on facts, it doesn't mean it's a good conclusion. You may want to take another look at our video about distinguishing fact from opinion for more information on this. Snap language has videos about reading, writing, and other topics. Knowing how to use the language well helps you think critically. Therefore, you should subscribe to this channel so you can get smarter through language. Well, this argument is totally true. Totally. Well, I'll see you in part two. For now, thanks for stopping by and watching this video. I'm serious though, uh, Snap Language rocks. Bye.